Advent. It's a real thing. But what is it? Advent really does refer to this idea or could mean the word coming or the arrival, anticipating. And in the church, it's meant a couple of things. Number one, the advent of the Lord in, the, in flesh, in human form at Christmas. This is the one where obviously, well, that made the word advent kind of popular. But the advent is also in the word and spirit. It's the spirit of God has come through Christ as Christ, in Christ, and made a physical presence in this earth. And then lastly, the final advent, when our Lord will return in bodily form and glory, whatever that will look like. There's lots of varied opinions on that. And my understanding is being expanded in that department. Each meaning stirs joyful anticipation of what God has accomplished and is doing and will bring things to completion. Advent is not just the completion of Christmas arriving. It's the advent of what Christ has already begun in you and me. He will bring to a finish what he started. He who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. Has God begun good news in you? In any kind of way. Have you had a negative perspective and a hopeless perspective on either God or life, whatever? Have you had any spark of hope at any time in your life? Usually the answer is yes, and often short-lived, but because there was the spark. If God began it, he ain't done yet. And that's what this Christmas anticipation, anticipation is for, is to become aware. Now, I know we're crazy busy, and for some of us, it feels like Christmas is like, shoot, I haven't, I haven't even got my tree up. I don't even have a tree yet. Sorry, Jen, you're not allowed to judge me. She puts hers up way too early. But <laughs> it's okay, we tease each other about it. Um, but there, it feels like, wait a minute, I, I have some stuff to get done first before I can even stop to think about Christmas. Like a church vote or something like that. Like, gee, <laughs> no distractions at all. And yet, the history of the church has shown us there's value in beginning the fourth Sunday before to begin the process of waking up. Not that you don't know it's coming. You do, because look at all the dumb advertising and the crazy lights out there. Man, you should have seen the Amish Christmas light tour. Oh, it was dark. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> but you, you see, you see these things going on. You see that there's a hustle and bustle. The kids get excited. If you're a poor teacher, oh my goodness, the wild ramped upness that happens with children, you know, as you get closer and closer to Christmas, because they see the lights, they see the color, they see the presents. And by the way, I heard a good, a really good trick for parents. How many of you have a fireplace at home? Okay, here's a great idea. Wrap up some empty boxes, package them up, make them really nice. When your kids are bad, you say, oh yeah? You throw one in the fire and go, hmm. Watch them change their behavior really fast. I love that one. <laughs> Just think about it. Empty box, yes. But there's an anticipation going on. There's excitement. Here at Hope Fellowship, we have a different anticipation. And uh, we had a Grounds and Grace um, coffee time on Friday, and I was reminded of something very important. Yes, we have an anticipation of a new location because we have to move due to landlord uh, redirect, and they have new plans for this spot. They told us it might happen when they bought the, new, bought the place because they took over uh, and bought this building uh, a year and a half ago or whatever it was, maybe even two years ago. So it wasn't like a complete shock, but it was a shock because I thought we had more time only to find out we didn't. And then the coolest part, a man walked in and said, hey, you guys looking for a place? We have a building that's too big for us and we need someone to come and share. Ah, oh, I think we're fine. We got another year or two. Three days later, I messaged the landlord. He said, well, actually, March 1st, we'd like you gone. Wow, call that God incidents. You can't plan that stuff. So there's an, 
anticipation and excitement building and brewing. And, and yet there's a flip side, and I caught this again. Not that I hadn't thought of it, but the way it was worded on Friday, I went, wow, we need to give people time to grieve. A lot of people put sweat and blood in this place. Terrell's already crying about the stage and sound booth because he put so much sweat and blood into it. But there are others who painted, put up drywall. There are others who measured and put glass in windows and doors and electrical outlets and people who hung sound equipment, ran wiring through the roof. There's a ton up there. Um, I'm going to take every little bit. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's... <laughs> There's a sadness. There's a sadness about leaving what you're comfortable with. When we first moved in, there was an excitement about, wow, we have our own place. We don't have to set chairs up or sound equipment every week. Yes! Ah, it was wonderful. Kind of relaxed a little bit. Say, ah, let's, hey, let's throw a plant over there. Hey, let's throw some dishes in the cupboard. Oh, I have some extra sugar. Stop bringing your extra stuff from now on. No more extra stuff at all, okay? Nobody's allowed to bring anything extra that's generously being donated, like extra plates and cup, none of that, no more. Because we can't. We're actually having to purge now. So thank you for the generosity, but give it somewhere else for now until we move and figure things out. Anticipating. They're anticipating cleaning out their closet. We're anticipating trying to figure out how to organize things. But there was an excitement when we first came in here. And it was very exciting. We were proud of it. We were the church in the mall. We were known as shop and pray location. That was our <laughs> cheeky, cheeky little saying that we had. Can't use that one anymore. Those, those days are going to be done. And there's a grief, a sadness associated with that. The mall is not our identity. You have to remember that. We're the church in the mall. That's how everybody knows us. That's only the location. Do they know the message? The message of hope. The message of grace. The message of identity in Christ. Are we known for the love of Jesus we purport? I think that's something we need to remember as we move. That is who we are. And maybe we haven't done a great job in the last couple of years because we're so focused on survival. Do you know what I mean? It's not easy. This move will bring about some healthy changes. It'll wake us up to take that, what do you call that thing when you use flour and get all the stuff out of it? or A sifter. Like it's going to sift and purge the chunks that shouldn't be there. They're... They're gonna, we get to toss that and realize we've got the good stuff to make a really good bread of life cake for people. We get to offer a high quality as we declutter. That means decluttering our thinking too. Not our faith, but declutter false concepts we have about God. The story of Zechariah is a powerful picture of traditionalism. Remember this, tradition is the, um, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. It's flipped. There is room and value for tradition, so long as the meaning is there, but when it lacks meaning, and we just do it because we've been told to and no longer find meaning in it, that's traditionalism. Well, that's the way we've always done it. Yeah, that's the problem. Advent has been going on since the early church. I think it's fourth century. Let me uh, have a note on that. Did I write it down? I don't know. I think it was in the fourth century that Advent became a formal part. So that's like 1,600 years. That's a good tradition. It's been done in a very boring way often, but it doesn't need to. We can bring life to it. Anticipation. There's going to be a sadness about leaving, but it's not an end of a, of a, 
end of the road. It's, it's just another phase in the journey. Pray for another church, part of the Vision Ministries. They have decided to close their church December 22nd. They meet at Lincoln Road Chapel in the afternoons. I think it's New, uh, New Life, or I forget what it's called. And they're having a hard time. We're just moving. They're closing. You know, second guessing. Did God really call us to do this? Of course he did. We're really good at hearing God at the start, but we're not good at hearing him say, okay, time. We're not good at that at all. Or I'm making a course correction. Are you okay with that? No, it's the way we've always done it. We've heard the Bible stories the same way for lots and lots of years. We've been told over and over and over again through tradition what the stories mean, what certain verses mean. And suddenly a day comes when God gets your attention and says, there's more hope in that verse and you had no way to see it until I just opened your eyes. And you go, what? I've read that verse forever. I never saw that before. Don, do you remember what that verse was on, that we talked about? You, you talked about that too. You never saw that before. What, what was the context of the topic? There's something really cool. Darn. See, so you got to come to Grounds and Grace. But there's hope. Not just sadness. There's sadness and change. There's anticipation in Christmas coming. There's also anticipation of a new location. New opportunities. New ways for us to meet. I know I was standing with uh, Rod in the new gym. We kind of did the mock setup of chairs. Oh, is this going to work? How is this going to set up? Put the chair, you know, all that stuff. And they have a stage. This is not a stage. They have a stage. And um, we thought, this is weird. I said, I feel weird. And then Rod was sitting in the front row, and he said, not weird, just different. Mm. Yeah, different. It's not what I'm used to. Yeah. There are going to be adjustments, and they're going to be good. Because what God started, he will see through to completion. It was in a living room 25, 26 years ago. How many, old, how many years old? 1994, when Hope Fellowship began? In a little living room. They chose the name of the church. You should hear the second runner-up name. It was going to be called Norm's Place. But now it's, it became Hope Fellowship. And part of the spark was the Jeremiah 29 11. I've come to give you a future and a hope. Not to tear you down, but to build you up. And somebody can get all gracilistic and go, that's old covenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go play your violin somewhere else. This is still good news. You can still repurpose some old verses that bring hope and encouragement. It's okay. Let's not overanalyze. Because I think the New Testament um, a bridge to Jeremiah 29.11 is Colossians 1.27. Psst. Here's the secret. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We anticipate hope. God has brought this church from a tiny nucleus to what it is now, of who we are and whatever it is. And where it's going, we just don't know, except hopefully Elmira, that part. But where, what's the future really going to hold? People are asking, what about five years from now, 10 years from now? I don't know. We won't know until next year when we have 2020 vision. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, come on. <laughs> that was really, thank you. I got a fan. We won't know. Let me remind you what happened in the story of Zechariah. He walks in to the holiest of holies. And by the way, he's part of, I think there's, if I remember my, can I cheat? No, I deleted that too. There's just too much info. Um, I think there are 24 groups of, of uh, religious leaders that ran the temple. Hundreds of priests in each one, and only once a year was this event done where one priest would go into the holiest of holies and do the sacrament. It was an honor once in a lifetime. And he comes in, and it was just another day 
It was something he'd observed his entire life. They were not expecting anything. After all, God had been dead silent for 400 years. And suddenly, and I love that line. I don't know if you, I, told, I was laughed at with Rod when I saw the video clip. Gabriel saying, don't be afraid. I'm thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> Seth. <laughs> oh my goodness. That was a great video. It was a little more realistic to what it could have been like. Out of the blue. How many times do we pray, God, please do this, please do that, you know, get these things to happen, and some of the stuff sort of happened. We, and we kind of plan God's work for us, you know, we help him out. But God blindsided Zechariah. I think he wants to do that with each of us, too. Sometimes we're looking in all the wrong places. When really the answer is, without sounding weird, it's within. The one who speaks using angels speaks inside you now because you are now one with Christ. You are in union with Jesus. The best kept secret in the Western church is our union with Christ, our oneness. It's not taught about often enough, nor is it understood we're learning. And Zechariah is shaking, trying to figure this out. This is just a normal day for work. Honey, you said, have a great day. Okay, bye, hon. It was a different day. And then he couldn't say anything. He was mute. Do you ever have people come ask you, well, how, tell me about this faith. What do you mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? What do you mean you're in union? And suddenly your voice is, I can't explain it. What do you mean you have peace deep inside? You can't say. What do you mean by transubstantiation? And the whole, it's like, what? All these dumb theological terms that have no place in normal conversations. Only the, those who go to school use these big terms. And they are important. But... Why make yourself an elitist by using that terminology when it's not the normal language? Find a gentle way so you don't make other people feel dumb. Because you make them dumb in the true sense. You mute them. Shut them out from a voice. When you get the right words to give an answer. Only then will you have the right words for your answer. Don't try and help God out. I think that's what messes us up when we come to sharing our hope of Christ in us with others. We get so religious. Have you been saved? What? What do you mean? I didn't know I was drowning. Like the, Some of the terminology we have for non-believers, and we call them non-believers, who made that term up? You don't use that term, in, like, I'm sorry, because now it's us versus them, in, out. Most people have an awareness of spiritual things going on around them, so be careful calling people unbelievers when they probably believe more spiritually than you might. They just have a name attached to it. Zechariah got blindsided, and the call for Christ mass came. It was through Zechariah's son. And by the way, uh, speeding through, because I have all the verses I was going to read all that, but I see the clock is just racing. Um, but what ends up happening is uh, when the baby is born, they're supposed to name this child, and, and some wisecrack person who thinks they know tradition, his name will be this. And same name as Zechariah, right? Because that's what you did. That's the way we've always done it. And John wrote out his name, sorry, Zechariah wrote, his name will be John. As soon as that happened, the authoritative choice was made. He was able to speak, and everybody was shocked. You're not allowed to pray for that gift on anybody else in your family. <laughs> Just so you know. But he learned a lesson. If you think you've got nothing left, so to speak, to give God, you're right. You don't. 
but your union with Christ does. And Zechariah thought he was done. There's no way he'd have kids. I see that hand. <laughs> Russ is just stretching his broken collarbone, but it looks like he's asking a question or saying, I am, I, I will. You know, I had to do that. Sorry, man. I know. I used to be Baptist. The best seats in the house are the back row. <laughs> There's an anticipation we need to remember in the coming days. Not just the gift stuff, but the reality that God chose to surprise humanity. Not surprise, he actually warned them in advance with multiple prophecies of Christ's coming. But he sure surprised the people on the ground at the time. And Zechariah was able to declare the glory of God. And at his age, when he thought he was done, no good for having kids, God blessed him. Now here's the tradition, traditionalism, why I first brought it up. Zechariah and his cronies had a traditional belief. This is how they saw God. This is why Jesus came to correct this. They saw God as, if you have children, God has blessed you. If you don't, you've been cursed by God or are cursed. That was what they believed. Because that's how the culture believed. Even from way back to Abraham, if you got lots of stuff, obviously God blessed you. When you have, it's taken away, you're cursed. Story of Job. Same thing. It hasn't changed. From way back then, right to Zechariah, they still saw that. And sorry, people still think that today. It's ridiculous. They have a faulty concept of who the loving God really is. He's not cursed you. He's blessed you. So don't attribute your circumstances to a blessing or a curse. Oh, I didn't tithe last week, so that's why I got a flat tire. God's getting to get his money one way or another. <laughs> what? I grew up with that. I literally grew up with that. No. The God who blesses and curses based on your behavior doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination but we do have a God that blesses us unconditionally and has blessed us. It's when we wake up to that good news, then we begin to experience those blessings. It's not, it's not that we have them suddenly and we, as if we didn't before. It's we wake up to what we do possess and go, wow, I didn't realize how fully I had these blessings. That to me is the gospel. Declaring the reconciliation you have been given. Are you trying to say everybody's saved? Don't go there. That's conditional thinking, the way when you use it, your term that way. There is a sense in Scripture where God has already saved the world. There's a sense that he is saving the world. There's also a sense in terminology that says he will save the world. So which one are you talking about? Don't play this conditional, faulty God concept language thing. Find the better hope-filled lens because Jesus came and he said this. I'm sorry for repeating it so often, but it's so good. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're the same. He was correcting all the faulty concepts that even Zechariah had. And Zechariah probably didn't realize the full extent of that until he woke up on the other side after he passed. What? I'm looking for that day. What? No way. Not quickly, though. So... I'm just saying, there's more going on than what we've been told. There's a better hope, a better anticipation. But if you think it's going to be all doom and gloom, oh, the world's just getting worse and it's terrible, oh no, you know, we got the tribulation coming, all that stuff, that's all fear mongering stuff. Oh my goodness, who made that up? And get taught as gospel. Mm -mm. I have a better hope filled perspective now, and I will not shut up about it because there's too many warmongers and fearmongers out there using the same Bible, and calling it biblical. Just because it's biblical doesn't make it Christ-like. You can have slaves and multiple wives and you name it and call it biblical, but it's not Christ-like. So be careful. Jesus came to reveal his Father and that his father has always been for us. That's the hope of Christmas, correcting these faulty concepts. That's what I hope to see happen. 
for the next number of weeks as we celebrate Christmas and Advent and the new location. Let's pray. Father, wake us up to your love and the reality that God is for us, not against us. Amen. We are going to take up two offerings, not just because we need money. (laughs) The first one is our budget offering, so please consider how in this month you can catch us up. We've got a lot to catch up on. We're not going to, I don't anticipate we're catching all of it up, but if we can catch up a good chunk, that'd be really great. But the second one is a benevolent offering, giving to those who need extra over this time of year. So please be generous with that. Those are separate offerings, and uh, it does not go to the church budget. If you're online, please continue to give. Thank you for those that are sending uh, donations. I can't believe it. There's some individuals that bless our church every couple months with a beautiful donation. It's like, wow, there are people in our church that probably don't even give that much. I'm shocked, and I'm thankful. God's got something up his sleeve here, and I'm glad to be a part of this. So in your heart, whatever God suggests for you to give, that's what you give. Don't let anybody tell you how much and clobber you and guilt you into giving. It's supposed to be with a cheerful heart. I'm still waiting for that laughter Sunday when we do take up our offering. But anyway, uh, you know what I mean? You get the attitude. Father, thank you that you are the one who provides for us. You've already provided a potential new location. You provided a new financial future. So Father, bless what comes in. May we be wise with it. Amen.